coming in on short notice to present these three lectures, two this afternoon and one in the morning, and, or I guess it's tomorrow afternoon, and one tomorrow. And so we're so happy to have Dr. Finn on campus. If you don't know his works, let me encourage you to find the book, The Baptist Story. He's a co-author of that very important work on, on Baptist history. He's the co-editor of volumes on uh, historical theology, Jonathan Edwards. Uh, he is the co-editor of what is projected to be the largest uh, theological contribution that Baptists have made in their past 400 years, Theology for the People of God, a 16-volume uh, work that will be produced during this decade, between now and 2030, and he'll be writing uh, the volume on sanctification uh, in that uh, particular series. So we are certainly pleased to have uh, Dr. Finn here with us. Uh, after I pray, uh, then you can join me in welcoming him to Southwestern Seminary, to the Land Lectures, and to this podium this afternoon. So let us pray together. For your goodness and grace to us, O Lord, we pause to say thanks. And for the gift of Richard Land and Nathan Finn, we offer our thanks to you. We thank you for the privilege of hearing them, learning from them this afternoon. Thank you for protecting them in their travels. And we ask now for your special blessings upon Dr. Finn as he comes to bring uh, this address this, this hour. Uh, use him in a way that would help us to think wisely about our role uh, to live out the gospel in this fallen world. We thank you, O oh God, for the wisdom that you've given to him, the preparation you have provided for him, and now as he articulates these truths to us, Give us ears to hear, minds to engage, and hearts willing to follow. For the sake of Christ, we pray. Amen. We join me, please, in welcoming Dr. Nathan Finn to the Land Lectures here this afternoon. Baptist College, and especially to have the opportunity to spend time with uh, one of my closest friends in the world, Dan Darling, my former pastor, Justin Wainscott, two of my great heroes in the faith, David Dockery and Richard Land, and uh, the list could go on. But this is a great place. You students don't know how blessed you are to be a part of the Southwestern Texas Baptist family. Uh, so I'm really appreciative of the opportunity. And let me just say one thing about why I'm here. Uh, you may know that I'm pinch hitting this week. Uh, my friend Ben Mitchell was originally going to be here. And if you've never heard Dr. Mitchell lecture, you don't know what you're missing. And so uh, he is recovering right now from an injury and uh, we've all been praying for him, and Lord willing, he'll be here in the future and have the opportunity uh, to lecture, and, and you're going to remember that a lot more than what you hear the next couple of days, because he's a, a great gift to the church and is also a Southwestern Seminary alum. Now, let me just make one sort of preliminary statement, uh, maybe a couple of preliminary statements before I really get started. So, I'm a big proponent of what I call Baptist Studies. And I know that sounds really nerdy if you're not the sort of person that gets excited about the Baptist tradition, but what I mean by Baptist studies is something a little bit thicker than just Baptist history. It's really Baptist history, Baptist theology, learning the best insights from sociologists and anthropologists, Baptist spirituality, Baptist applied ethics, sort of that whole scope of thinking and living as Baptist followers of Jesus Christ. That's what I get excited about. And we're going to deal a little bit with that uh, over the next couple of days during these lectures. And so the theme is Baptists and cultural engagement, Southern Baptists and cultural engagement in particular. And we're going to be drawing upon a little bit of all of those different disciplines and those different trajectories as we consider this theme. Uh, we're going to be looking at three different spheres of culture. We're going to look today at politics in this first lecture, 
We're going to look at science in the second lecture. And then tomorrow for the third lecture, uh, we're going to look um, at education. And then uh, for the fourth gathering together, that's primarily going to be uh, a Q&A and a lot more back and forth uh, with the audience and an interview and that sort of thing. Uh, but today, we're going to begin by talking about politics. And if you know anything about Baptists and you know anything about politics, you know Baptists talk a lot about religious liberty and the separation of church and state. So I've titled this first lecture, The Separation of Church and State, A Southern Baptist Perspective. Baptists have always advocated soul freedom or liberty of conscience in matters of religion. As such, Baptists affirm the principle of a free church in a free state, or as it has commonly become known, especially in the United States, the separation of church and state. And this is not just true of Baptists in general, this is true of Southern Baptists in particular. For example, this is what we say in the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. God alone is Lord of the conscience, and He has left it free from the doctrines and commandments of men, which are contrary to His word or not contained in it. Church and state should be separate. The state owes to every church protection and full freedom in the pursuit of its spiritual ends. In providing for such freedom, no ecclesiastical group or denomination should be favored by the state more than others. Civil government being ordained by God, it is the duty of Christians to render loyal obedience thereto in all things, not contrary to the revealed will of God. The church should not resort to the civil power to carry on its work. The gospel of Christ contemplates spiritual means alone for the pursuit of its ends. The state has no right to impose penalties for religious opinions of any kind. The state has no right to impose taxes for the support of any form of religion. A free church in a free state is the Christian ideal. And this implies the right of free and unhindered access to God on the part of all men and the right to form and propagate opinions in the sphere of religion without interference by the civil power. Now, I know that that's a lengthy statement. It's a confessional statement. But the two key lines in that statement that we're going to zero in on are churches and states should be separate and a free church and a free state is the Christian ideal. While those phrases might seem clear enough, over the past couple of generations, the idea of church-state separation has become fairly controversial among Southern Baptists, and sometimes that's for a good reason. So in this lecture, I want to offer a Southern Baptist perspective on the separation of church and state, but it's important that you hear me say that I'm not advancing the Southern Baptist position. As you may know, where two or three Southern Baptists are gathered together, there are 19 opinions. And so this is the case with nearly anything in Baptist life. That even includes Baptist distinctives, and that even includes church and state. So there's no such thing as the unanimously held Baptist position on this. Nevertheless, I do think that there are distinctively Baptist and even distinctively Southern Baptist ways of thinking about uh, the separation of church and state, and that's the stream that I'm going to try and swim in today. Like many of our Baptist forebears, I argue that a formal separation of church and state remains the best provisional arrangement for safeguarding the principle of religious liberty for all people. When there is full religious liberty, liberty, there is less occasion for the state to introduce coercion or confusion into matters of ultimate importance. Rightly understood, the separation of church and state guarantees the freedom of all people, regardless of their religious commitments or even sometimes lack thereof, to practice those commitments in accordance with their conscience. It also guarantees the freedom of us as believers to share the truth of the gospel with non-believers, making the very best case we can with the help of the Holy Spirit 
for the faith that was once and for all delivered unto the saints. In the midst of a world where there are a variety of competing religious claims and irreligious claims. For Baptist, church-state separation is not first and foremost about how best to interpret a constitutional principle or even about how best to embody one of our historic Baptist distinctives, but rather it's ultimately about the Great Commission to proclaim the good news of King Jesus and to make disciples among all peoples. And that's a political statement, that Jesus is king. So I'm going to begin by surveying early Baptist understandings of church and state. This will be familiar ground for some of those who are in attendance today. These might be names you've heard in a Baptist history course, or they might have even come up in a systematic theology course. But I'm then going to focus upon several noteworthy Southern Baptists who over the last century or so have written on this topic. Though all Southern Baptists, at least in theory, affirm religious liberty, by the 1970s the issue had become controversial, leading to competing accounts for how best to account for the separation of church and state. And then I'm going to close with a call at the end for Southern Baptists to remain committed to this principle of a free church in a free state to the glory of God and for the sake of Great Commission faithfulness. So let's begin by talking about early Baptist and church-state separation. In 1612, the English Baptist pioneer Thomas Helwes established the first Baptist church on English soil. Uh, it was in a community called Spitalfields that is now part of the East End of London. That same year, 1612, Helwes wrote a short declaration of the mystery of iniquity. And he argued in that book for liberty of conscience in matters of religion. He did not argue merely for religious toleration, nor did he limit his arguments about liberty of conscience just to Orthodox Christians. But rather, he advocated for full religious freedom for all people, including heretics, Jews, and Muslims. This was a radical claim at the time. And it was made all the more remarkable because of Helwes's handwritten inscription in the copy of his book that he sent to King James I. Yes, that King James. This is what he said. The king is a mortal man and not God. Therefore, he has no power over the immortal souls of his subjects to make laws and ordinances for them and to set spiritual lords over them. If the king has authority to make spiritual lords and laws, then he is an immortal God and not a mortal man. That didn't go real well for him when you say things like that to the king. Helwes was in prison for his controversial beliefs, eventually dying in London's notorious Newgate prison around 1616. But the die had been cast. The die had been cast. And since the early 1600s, going all the way back to Helwes, Baptists have remained tireless defenders of soul freedom. In the generation after Helwes, Baptists and colonial New England were making a similar case for religious liberty. Roger Williams and John Clark are considered the co-founders of the colony of Rhode Island. Each man had fled Massachusetts in search of greater religious freedom than was possible under the Puritan establishment. Each subsequently became a Baptist founding the first two Baptist churches in the English colonies in Providence and Newport, respectively. Each of them also wrote in defense of religious liberty. In 1644, Williams penned the bloody tenet of persecution, followed in 1652 by Clark's Ill News from New England. Both of these books cataloged religious persecution that Baptists and other religious dissenters were facing under the Puritans, and they made the case for liberty of conscience. But Williams went a little bit further, and he argued for a clear distinction between what he called the garden of the church and the wilderness of the world. In a follow-up work to the bloody tenant, Williams played off of that metaphor, and he advocated for what he called, quote, a hedge or wall of separation between the garden of the church and the wilderness of the world. 
of the world. A century and a half after that, President Thomas Jefferson would invoke similar language when he claimed the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution created a wall of separation between church and state, a claim he made, by the way, in an 1802 letter to the Baptists in Danbury, Connecticut, who were being persecuted by the state church there. Now, just as an aside, I know that there are lots of folks who love them some Puritans. And they love those banner of truth books. And maybe they get excited about Calvinism and things like that. And if you're one of those folks, more power to you. There's so much that you can benefit from that great theological tradition. But you know what Puritans did to Baptists? They kicked them out. And they put them in chains and they beat them. And so just remember, no theological tradition is perfect. We want to learn from everybody. But uh, Puritans and Baptists were historically uh, not close friends, at least in the American colonies. A little bit different in England, but not in the American colonies. Since the time of Williams, the consensus among Baptists in America is that the best way to protect religious liberty is to champion the formal separation of church and state. Baptists the world over echo these sentiments to this day, whether they are free citizens of liberal nations that adhere to church-state separation or whether they're oppressed minorities struggling to worship freely under atheistic or theocratic regimes. But the separation of church and state has enjoyed particular resonance with Baptists in America. This is partly because the First Amendment rejects a religious establishment when it says Congress shall shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That's one reason. Baptists in the USA appreciate that one of their cherished principles is enshrined in the Constitution. But second, and maybe just as important, Baptists claim to have played a small but strategic role in influencing the course of early American disestablishment. In 1773, New England Baptist minister Isaac Bacchus authored a book titled An Appeal to the Public for Religious Liberty Against the Oppressions of the Present Day. It's back when you knew a book's title. A uh, book's thesis was in the title back then. They, they weren't clever. They just told you what they were thinking. In that treatise, Bacchus echoed Williams's earlier argument for the separation of church and state to protect religious liberty against the coercive Congregationalist establishment. That was one of those Puritan traditions. Bacchus was troubled that Baptists in New England continued to be persecuted for their dissenting beliefs. He petitioned the Massachusetts delegates to the Continental Congress to end compulsory tithes to support the establishment, and later he voiced his approval of the First Amendment to the Bill of Rights when he attended the Massachusetts Convention that ratified the U.S. Constitution. As historian Brandon O'Brien argues, Bacchus fought for more than half a century to make America a nation that protects every citizen's right to exercise their religion according to their conscience. Also in 1788, the Baptist evangelist John Leland met with James Madison, that James Madison, who was seeking Baptist support for his election to the House of Representatives from Virginia. Leland had been contemplated had been contemplating running in the election himself to promote the cause of soul freedom. The two men came to an agreement. Leland withdrew from the race, and he encouraged Baptists to vote for Madison in exchange for Madison championing the same sort of understanding of full religious liberty that he and Jefferson already believed. Both of them were Virginians. They were acquaintances of John Leland and Leland was simply asking that Madison make that a policy agenda, if you will, that he would take with him. Madison was elected. And a little while later, a couple of steps along the way, but a little while later, subsequently drafted what became the First Amendment to the Bill of Rights, which was amended to the U.S. Constitution in 1789, ratified by the requisite number of states in 1791. John Ragosta argues that the views of the Baptists remained, quote, particularly weighty for Madison throughout the religious liberty debates in Virginia and the eventual adoption of the First Amendment. 
The ideas of men like Williams and Bacchus and Leland continues to influence how Baptists in America in particular think about religious liberty and church-state separation. Among Southern Baptists, the turn of the 20th century, however, also introduced a chorus of additional voices that have been gradually added to what we might consider the cloud of witnesses for soul freedom that continues to the present day. So what I want to do is highlight how a selection of key Southern Baptist thinkers have discussed the separation of church and state during the century or so from 1908 to 2015. The list is representative. It's not going to be everybody who spoke or wrote on this topic because there's more people than we have time to talk about. But what I do want to do is give you sort of these case studies of the most important Baptist contributors to this topic uh, during that time frame. Uh, We've had a lot of Baptists who've written on the importance of a free church and a free state. So let's first talk about E.Y. Mullins. E.Y. Mullins was almost certainly the most influential Southern Baptist theologian during his lifetime and arguably the entire 20th century. As Albert Moeller argues, Mullins, more than any other writing theologian among Southern Baptists, remains the one figure against whom almost any other theologian is compared. His numerous noteworthy writings included the Axioms of Religion in 1908, which was an interpretation of what it means to be Baptist, and the Christian religion in its doctrinal expression in 1917, a widely adopted theology textbook that was even used on this campus uh, for a time. Mullins was also one of the leading denominational statesmen of his era. From 1899 until his death in 1928, Mullins was president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He also served as president of the Southern Baptist Convention for four different years. He chaired the committee that drafted the Baptist Faith and Message in 1925. He was even president of the Baptist World Alliance for five years. He was Mr. Baptists. Mullins addressed the separation of church and state in the axioms of religion. Uh, He gave a whole chapter to the topic. Mullins argued of Baptists, quote, "...there has never been a time in their history..." so far as that history is known to us, when they wavered in their doctrine of a free church in a free state. He discusses in that book the history of the modern religious establishment in England. He contrasted this view of church and state with that of Roger Williams and the Virginia Baptist that we mentioned a minute ago. And Mullen's suggestion suggested that Baptists have made a significant contribution uh, to all of Western civilization with their Uh, commitment to church-state separation. He conceded that in a perfect society, church and state might be united, but because there's no such thing as a perfect society, the functions of church and state ought to remain separate, this side of the eschaton. This separation for Mullins relates to those different functions. Mullins argued the church is a voluntary spiritual organization while the state is a temporal organization that compels our obedience through laws. Thus, while church and state are compatible, and they can certainly coexist harmoniously, the church is its own holy commonwealth that is free and independent of state control. Mullins closed his argument by applying the principle of church-state separation to the question of tax exemption. For religious property. He argued that uh, exemptions were appropriate because the state has no authority over the church and it's not the business of the state to collect property taxes from churches. One of Mullins's contemporaries was George W. Truitt, longtime pastor of First Baptist Church of Dallas right down the road. Like Mullins, Truett was a denominational statesman who was president of the Southern Baptist Convention for three terms, as well as president of the Baptist World Alliance. But unlike Mullins, who was more of an academic theologian, though he could preach, Truett was more of a preacher, though he was pretty theologically savvy. Truett was widely considered one of the most eloquent pulpiteers of his era. During World War I in 1918, 
Truett was invited by President Woodrow Wilson to serve as one of 20 American ministers who were selected to preach to the Allied forces in Europe under the sponsorship of the YMCA. All of Truett's books were sermon anthologies, just like today. There is a certain type of pastor who preaches a certain type of sermon series that becomes a certain type of book. That was the sort of thing that Truett was doing during his own day. And uh, all of those books almost remain in print. Most of them do. So there's an enduring quality uh, to his work. In an obituary published uh, in the Christian century, J.M. Dawson, who we're going to talk about in a minute, said this of Truett. The consensus at the time of his passing ascribed Dr. Truett's extraordinary powers to his eloquence, his brotherliness toward all men, and his passion for souls. In other words, he loved people, he loved lost people, and he could flat preach. Truett's most noteworthy sermon was his address, Baptist and Religious Liberty, which he preached on May 16, 1920, from the east steps of the U.S. Capitol. You can see the picture of that on the screen. Uh, this is while the Southern Baptist Convention was holding its annual meeting uh, that spring in Washington. Like Mullins, Truett argued that religious liberty is the supreme Baptist contribution to the wider world. Baptists are not satisfied with just tolerating people's religious beliefs. That concedes too much power to the state. But rather, Baptists affirm absolute religious liberty as a matter of principle and as a gift from God. Drawing upon Jesus' command in Matthew twenty two twenty one to render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's and unto, unto God the things that are God's, Truett argued for what he called the divorcement, but what we would call the separation of church and state. The biblical model of separation was rejected uh, during the uh, late patristic and medieval era under uh, the arrangement that we would call Constantinianism. Maybe that's something we could talk about tomorrow. Uh, it continued in various forms into the Reformation period before finally being recovered by the modern Baptists. Uh, he didn't say anything about the Anabaptists, but they also recovered that. Far from church-state separation leading to the absence of a religious witness in the public square, Truett believed this arrangement fosters the freedom to promote religious education and evangelistic advance. Both Mullins and Truett wrote on church-state separation at a time of great cultural optimism. Each man was a proponent of what we might now call American exceptionalism. And they closely identified uh, Baptist democracy, if you will, with American democracy. Though neither of them would likely have appreciated the concept of a civil religion because they were good Baptists, both of them articulated their views on church and state within a milieu that was still profoundly shaped by this broad, generic, Protestant, Christian worldview that had been present in America since its founding and was kind of uh, reaching its nadir uh, during the mid-20th century. That consensus would remain largely unchallenged through those early post-war years into the administration of Dwight D. Eisenhower. In 1954, Congress added the words under God to the Pledge of Allegiance, followed two years later by a joint resolution adopting In God We Trust as the national motto of the United States. Both of those moves were made during the Eisenhower administration. That's a picture of him interacting with the famous Southern Baptist evangelist Billy Graham. Uh, both of those moves were made during that time to show that the United States was a more righteous and religious counterpart to the atheistic communism of the Soviet Union. That's the context in which these men were working. Yet, there were some Baptists who were uncomfortable with the God and country emphasis of this early Cold War era. For example, J.M. Dawson, who I mentioned a moment ago, emerged as the leading Southern Baptist voice for the separation of church and state during the mid-20th century. He served for over 30 years as the pastor of First Baptist Church of Waco, during which time he was also a respected denominational leader. When he retired from pastoral ministry, Dawson was, from 1946 to 1953, the founding executive director of what was then called the Baptist Joint Committee on Public Affairs, a special interest group, if you will, 
that represented the views of several Baptist denominations in Washington with special emphasis on defending religious liberty. In 1957, Baylor University, which is also in Waco, established what is now the J.M. Dawson Institute for Church State Studies to honor Dawson and his legacy. Two of Dawson's books, which you see on the screen, separate church and state now and America's way in church, state, and society, anticipated changes that would come to American culture in the 1960s. Motivated both by his commitment to Baptist principles and concerns over potential government aid to Catholic parochial schools and the ongoing debate of whether the U.S. should have an ambassador to Vatican City, Dawson advocated for what we might call a strict separation of church and state. During this same time, a number of leaders, primarily from mainline Protestant traditions, came together and they formed an organization called, then, Protestants and Other Americans United for the Separation of Church and State. Later, just Americans United for the Separation of Church and State. Dawson served as the first executive director of Americans United, which is interesting because the relationship between the Baptist Joint Committee and Americas United would provoke considerable controversy 40 years later. Dawson's final major work, Baptist in the American Republic, was a study of Baptist influence on American culture with emphasis on the separation of church and state. The two decades between 1945 and 1965 were a transitional period marked by growing international tensions related to the Cold War, armed conflicts in Southeast Asia that were proxies for the Cold War, the emerging civil rights movement in the U.S., persistent technological advances, government expansion, and significant economic growth that raised the standard of living in the USA. This is that period when the baby boomers, the earliest baby boomers were born and came of age. And within that milieu, a series of influential Supreme Court decisions drew upon Jefferson's metaphor of the wall of separation to codify the strict separation of church and state as the best way to interpret the First Amendment. In Everson versus the Board of Education, the court upheld a New Jersey statute that used taxpayers' funds to bus children to private Catholic schools. However, in the majority opinion, which was written by a justice named Hugo Black, a Baptist Sunday school teacher from Alabama, the court argued the statute was constitutional precisely because it did not violate the Establishment Clause in the First Amendment and the wall of separation that had been erected between church and state. In Engel v. Vital in 1962, The court ruled that school-sponsored prayer in public schools was unconstitutional because it violated the Establishment Clause. Again, Hugo Black, a Southern Baptist, wrote the majority opinion. Two additional cases in 1963 struck down teacher-led Bible reading and teacher-led teachers leading students in the Lord's Prayer uh, using that same reasoning. While many fundamentalists attacked these decisions as evidence of godlessness, which contributed to the rise of the religious right in the 1970s, Southern Baptist editorials and resolutions at the time praised the court for upholding the separation of church and state. The Dawson-Black view of church-state separation continued to be the position of the Baptist Joint Committee through the presidential tenures of a man named Emanuel Carlson, who served in the 50s through 1971, and James Wood, who served in the 70s until 1980. However, during James Dunn's turn as president of the Baptist Joint Committee, which lasted from 81 to 99, the separation of church and state became a hotly contested topic among Southern Baptists. The early Dunn years coincided with both the early days of the inerrancy controversy in the Southern Baptist Convention as well as the rise of the religious right within the Republican Party. The latter was a movement that mobilized mostly conservative Protestants to become active in the Republican Party and to advocate against abortion on demand, the normalization of homosexuality, 
and the secularization of the public square, among other priorities. The religious right became a key constituent within the Republican coalition that elected Ronald Reagan in 1980 and 1984 and fueled the Republican takeover of Congress in 1994. In general, in general, the religious right responded negatively to the strict separation of church and state advanced by the Supreme Court in the 1960s, in part because many of them were committed to the idea that America has always had a special place in God's divine plans. More on that in a few minutes. But for Southern Baptists, the debate about church and state was somewhat more complicated. During the final quarter of the 20th century, there were at least three general perspectives among Southern Baptists when it came to church-state separation and how to relate that to the idea of America's Christian identity. The first two views were common among conservative Southern Baptists. Some of them embraced a form of Christian nationalism, arguing that America was founded as an explicitly Christian nation as a part of God's divine plan. This view was very common in the wider religious right, reflected in Peter Marshall's 1977 bestseller, The Light and the Glory, which you see on the screen. Uh, it was very common in Christian private school and homeschool history curricula, and was also found among uh, individuals like David Barton and his Wall Builders organization. Many Baptist laypeople, and at least some pastors, affirmed the idea that America was, by design, a Christian nation. Sometimes proponents of this view rejected in principle church-state separation, identifying that as a concept that was really more about secular humanism than it was the Baptist tradition. For example, in what I think was just a throwaway one-liner, longtime Southern Baptist leader W.A. Criswell memorably referred to the separation of church and state as, quote, the figment of some infidel's imagination during a 1984 television interview. That statement put him at odds with the historic Baptist position. Now, I didn't know Dr. Criswell. Some people in the room did. I have reason to believe his, his views were actually a little bit more balanced than that, but never, you know, one-liners get preachers in trouble. And, uh, and that was, that was a one-liner. A second view of American history, more prominent among conservative Southern Baptist scholars, was that America was not founded as an explicitly Christian nation, but that the Judeo-Christian tradition had deeply influenced the nation's historic identity, a fact that should be acknowledged and even celebrated. Barry Hankins argues this perspective was common among Baptist public intellectuals, who understood it to be more historically faithful than the idea that America was a Christian nation without any sort of further nuance. Most Southern Baptists of this persuasion embraced what might be called an accommodationist view of church and state. Accommodationists rejected the idea of a state-sponsored religion, but they believed the government should adopt a generally friendly posture towards religion. As a rule, they embraced the free exercise clause of the First Amendment and emphasized that a little bit more than the anti-establishment clause, though Baptist accommodationists certainly were not in favor of religious establishment. America was not a Christian nation, per se, but rather was a nation of Christians, and the Constitution guaranteed their and others' religious liberty. The third view what Carl Esbeck calls strict separationism, argued that America was officially a secular nation, albeit one influenced significantly by Christians, and especially Protestant Christians at various points during its history. However, strict separationists rejected Christian nationalism and even accommodationism, arguing that America should be neutral toward religion. They identified their view of church and state with earlier Baptist thinkers from Williams through Truett. James Dunn, who we talked about a minute ago, was the leading advocate of this perspective, arguing that strict separationism was the historic Baptist position and that accommodationists had sold their souls to the religious right. Conservative critics maintained that Dunn and the Baptist Joint Committee allied themselves too often with the left-wing secularist movement, 
embodied in such groups like the American Civil Liberties Union and the Americans United for the Separation of Church and State. And that strict separationists seemed embarrassed at times by overt displays of patriotism. And that too many of them were also generally supportive, uh, supportive of what we might today call progressive positions on social issues, especially abortion and LGBTQ plus type topics. In 1988, Richard Land was elected president of the Christian Life Commission, the Southern Baptist agency that was tasked with speaking to the convention on ethical matters and social concerns. Dr. Land is, of course, the namesake for the Land Center for Cultural Engagement. He had previously served as a faculty member at Criswell College and an administrator. He had worked as an advisor to Texas Governor Bill Clements. He had been a member of the Baptist, uh, excuse me, of the Public Affairs Committee, which represented the SBC on the Baptist Joint Committee. When Southern Baptists voted to defund the Baptist Joint Committee in 1991, the Christian Life Commission was reassigned the responsibility of representing the SBC in matters of religious liberty. And in 1997, the name of that entity was changed to what it is today, the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. Land served as president of ERLC from 1988 until 2013. But he was also active in public life beyond our denomination. For example, he was appointed a commissioner to the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom by President George W. Bush. Reflecting his academic background, Land edited collections of scholarly essays on Christianity and politics that originated as addresses given at seminars hosted by the ERLC, in addition to many other essays that he published elsewhere. But he proved especially adept at bridging the gap between the academy, the church, and faith-inspired activism. As a leading conservative public intellectual, Land was frequently interviewed by news outlets. He also hosted a live syndicated radio program for over a decade, frequently penned op-ed pieces for national publications, and wrote several popular books that advocated a socially conservative vision for America. Land's book, The Divided States of America, What Liberals and Conservatives Are Missing in the God and Country Shouting Match, was a popular account of the accommodationist view of church and state, though one that was rooted in Land's appreciation for Baptist history and the close tie between church-state separation and the freedom to practice and proclaim Christian truth. We need a new edition of that book, Dr. Land. In 2013, Russell Moore became the president of ERLC, a position he held until 2021. Moore came to ERLC from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary where he taught theology and served as the chief academic officer for nearly a decade. His position on church and state did not perfectly align with Land's accommodation, accommodationism, but neither did it align with Dunn's form of strict separationism. Instead, he affirmed a view similar to what Esbeck calls free will separationism, which argues for state neutrality toward religion but envisions the church as having a prophetic posture toward the state. Like Land, Moore emphasized the importance of Orthodox Christian voices contributing vigorously to public discourse and advocating for the common good. But like Dunn, Moore was concerned that at least some forms of accommodationism, not so much among Baptist thinkers as kind of out there in pop culture, uh, took an overly positive outlook towards civil religion. Moore emphasized the kingdom of God, contrasting it with the earthly kingdoms, including the United States. For Moore, the separation of church and state was primarily a question of mission. Church-state separation preserves soul freedom, thus providing the best cultural context for authentic faith to flourish and the gospel to advance. So let's talk a little bit about this, the Great Commission and church-state separation. As we enter the third decade of the 21st century, it has never been more important for Southern Baptists to maintain our historic commitment to the separation of church and state. The secularist left and their sympathizers continue to threaten religious liberty in the U.S., especially, but not exclusively, 
the freedom of theologically and morally orthodox Christians. Often these threats are in response to Christians maintaining traditional views of gender and marriage in public ways that run afoul of the progressive status quo. As in the much publicized cases of the Colorado Baker, Jack Phillips, and the Washington State florist, Baronel Stutzman. Religious freedom, historic Christian views of marriage and family, and the sanctity of human life are often intertwined in both public controversies and legal challenges, creating the need for Southern Baptists and other Orthodox believers across ecclesial traditions to link arms for the sake of human flourishing. Organizations such as Alliance Defending Freedom, Beckett, the Thomas More Society, the Religious Freedom Institute, and Southern Baptist's own ERLC, among many others, are on the front lines of defending religious freedom for all, primarily from threats from the left-wing end of the ideological spectrum. However, threats to religious freedom do not only come from the secularist left. Some voices on the right side of the aisle, if you were, which at times cloak their arguments in Christian language, also threaten religious liberty by rejecting or downplaying church-state separation. Let me give you two examples. In the 2010s, a number of communities passed local ordinances to prevent Muslims from building mosques. The ERLC rightly defended American Muslims against challenges to their religious freedom noting that a threat to their liberty was a potential threat to the liberty of others, including Baptists. As Moore argued in response to a question from a concerned Southern Baptist, quote, when you have a government that says we can decide whether or not a house of worship is being constructed based upon the theological beliefs of that house of worship, then there are going to be Southern Baptists in San Francisco and New York and throughout this country who are not going to be able to build. Our current Southern Baptist Convention president and Southwestern Seminary alum, Bart Barber, is also a vocal defender of the religious freedom of Muslims using similar arguments to Dr. Moore. In more recent years, conservatives have embraced a variety of ideas that at best downplay the importance of church-state separation. For the sake of time, let me just summarize here. There are various versions of theonomy that are making a comeback but they're often championed today by independent charismatics rather than the sort of weird sectarian reform traditions that we're arguing for a generation ago. Integralism, which is rooted in historic Roman Catholic views of church, state, and religious authority, has also become vogue among some social conservatives, not all of whom are themselves Catholics. The recent and still evolving national conservative movement is skeptical of the merits of America's historic commitment to classical liberalism, including among at least some of them a tendency to argue that America is or ought to be a Christian nation. Still others are attempting to recover classical Protestant understandings of church and state that were popular in post-Reformation Europe but haven't been championed in America since the disestablishment of state churches in the late 17 and early 1800s. To be crystal clear, each of these trends are reacting to the growing decadence of American culture, as well as the ongoing efforts of progressive elites to impose their values on Orthodox Christians and other social conservatives. But Baptists need to remain cautious about these trends, at least keep an eye on them, because they're difficult to reconcile with our historic emphases on soul freedom and church-state separation. Dr. Land is surely correct that the Judeo-Christian tradition has deeply shaped American history and that secularist trends since the mid-20th century, including some that affected court decisions about church and state, have contributed to a post-Christian and increasingly anti-Christian context. We are right to lament the waning of the Christian worldview in the public square. Southern Baptists committed to our historic view of a free church and a free state must make clear we are not embracing even implicitly what the late Richard John Newhouse famously described as a naked public square, wherein religious claims are ruled out of bounds because they're religious claims. Instead, by defending the sole freedom of unbelievers to hold incorrect or irreligious views on matters of doctrine and ethics, 
We are also defending the freedom of believers to worship and witness in accordance with their conscience. Dr. Moore is also correct that this very shift toward a post-Christian culture means Southern Baptists and other Orthodox Christians should increasingly think of ourselves as a prophetic moral minority rather than a beleaguered moral majority. We are right to see this as an opportunity to clarify and perhaps in some cases purify our public witness. This will take an act of imagination as we consider what it means to affirm a Baptist public theology in a post-Christian America where our views are rejected by a growing number of citizens and we are part of a remnant that is marginalized and in some instances maybe even persecuted. Moving forward, Southern Baptists need to think of the separation of church and state as a missional principle rooted in God's character and his great commission of global disciple-making. That's a posture that I'm confident both doctors Land and Moore would unhesitatingly affirm. J.M. Dawson has rightly argued that the principle of church-state separation rested originally upon evangelical faith and personal regeneration, although many people at the time were not aware of that fact. This remains the case today, even among many Baptists. Pastors and other ministry leaders must remind the present generation of Southern Baptists that the separation of church and state, when rightly understood, is ultimately about creating a context where all people are free to follow their conscience in matters of religion. In turn, this provides Southern Baptists and other Christians with the freedom to proclaim the kingship of Jesus Christ and call upon all men and women to freely bow the knee to Him through repentance and faith rather than coercion or compulsion. This arrangement, which Southern Baptist ethicist Andrew Walker provocatively refers to as Christian secularism, is by no means permanent. It's not going to continue into the eschaton. But until that day when the kingdom of this world become the kingdom of our Lord and His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever, Revelation eleven fifteen, we should continue to champion religious freedom for all people, and the separation of church and state to the glory of God, for the health of the church, for the advance of the gospel, and for the sake of human flourishing. Thank you. left and I'm going to 